Ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to the square in Brussels, welcome to Carnegie Europe, and welcome to NATO for this uh, conference here today. I'm already starting to address you as you are streaming into the room because we are on a very, very tight schedule here, at least for the initial part of the conference, um, because Jamie Shea, the Deputy Assistant Secretary General of NATO, who will be our keynote speaker, has to um, exercise, has to execute a, a hit and run operation here. He needs to leave this building at 20 past uh, on the dot. Uh, to go over to London and save the world there, in addition to saving it here today. Um, so we want to give him the floor very, very quickly. I just want to say welcome to all of you to our luxury conference. It's a luxury conference because we are, of course, in a luxury moment of history, trying to make a luxury argument, which is really based on a luxury problem, and a continent that for hundreds and hundreds of years um, had no better occupation than killing itself. We have to convince publics all of a sudden that armies and military instruments and operational capacity do matter for them. Defense matters. That's the uh, headline of this conference. And it's slightly ironic, obviously, that this continent has come to the point where you actually have to make the case that needs to invest maybe a little more, not only in terms of money, but also in terms of mental readiness, if you will, and the political culture between the ears. Um, NATO started a Defense Matters campaign a few months ago and invited think tanks from across Europe and from across NATO um, to talk to their audiences in their home countries uh, and to find out what the state of the defense debate in those countries were. And um, they uh, came up with their, with their results, with their reports, and today's conference is really um, the kind of conclusion of that process that was started. We want to look a bit deeper, not only into the results, but into the wider kind of defense debate and make that luxury point that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, this is all I want to say because Jamie is already shivering with anticipation, and I'm sure all of you are. Thank you very much again for coming. Jamie, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Jan, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, thank you for giving me this uh, last minute, but nonetheless welcome for that uh, opportunity to uh, open the uh, conference uh, uh, today. Um, my wife uh, reminded me this morning of the famous words of uh, uh, Shelley speaking about Lord Byron, that he had uh, uh, lost the gift of communication, but unfortunately not the art of speaking. Uh, and my time limit today probably means that I'm going to fall into that trap as well. Um, let me also, at the outset, make it clear that when it comes to the future narrative of the armed forces and defense, I'm simply giving you my personal uh, uh, thoughts, uh, uh, personal observations, personal feelings uh, about this, uh, and uh, hopefully what I have to say, uh, even if it's not going to be uh, received wisdom at the end, will at least stimulate the discussions that are going to uh, uh, follow. Um, there was once uh, a famous uh, Soviet academi academician, Gorgi Abatov, who at the end of the Cold War was fond of sort of going around NATO chancelleries and saying, we have uh, uh, killed you. We have taken away your threat. Um, some people today may, in a similar mode, believe that NATO uh, cannot exist either uh, without an operation. The end of the ISAF mission in Afghanistan, of course, does not mean the end of NATO operations. The chairman of the military committee knows that better than uh, anybody else. But it does sort of mark a, a fairly unique situation for the alliance, where almost for the first time, uh, in its 60-year history, uh, we will not uh, have an immediate major operation as a kind of guiding principle around which to coale co coalesce our efforts. Now, NATO will no longer be the organization of the one uh, big idea. Uh, and secondly, uh, of course, we won't have, if you like, uh, an adversary, uh, whether uh, real or potential, latent or patent, uh, as the focus for our planning uh, activities. Um, now, of course, if you are a military person, this is not a paradigm that really fits, even if it's a widespread public perception. You know that operations are going on. You know that unlike World War I or World War II, the end of ISAF does not mean a transition from a state of war to a state of at least uh, relative uh, peace. Uh, you know that unlike the end of World War I or World War II, the end of ISAF has not changed the world in a fundamental way, which brings about a whole new geopolitical context. But our public opinion, our public opinion, very weary 
uh, of the last 10 years of uh, end-to-end -end, uh, operations, which, are, as all, all of us know, have cost a good deal in uh, lives and, uh, uh, and treasure and resources, sometimes at least in the public perception for inconclusive uh, results, does see it in a kind of sort of end of a war, end of an era uh, kind of uh, 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 way. And therefore, uh, the armed forces, uh, as they uh, return to Europe, at least many of them, and confronted with a public opinion that overwhelmingly is focusing on domestic issues, for example, in my country, the UK, a recent opinion poll showed that uh, 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 only 16% identified uh, foreign policy and defence as significant priorities for the government. In the United States, that figure was about 50% uh, just uh, eight or nine years ago. Uh, today, it's gone down to only 18%. So our public opinion, number one, sort of senses that in the future operations are going to be uh, less uh, visible. We won't be able to hang the narrative uh, around uh, reality TV shows showing all of the very good things that our troops are doing in Afghanistan. Um, planning is not an event. Planning is not a picture. Cyber defense is very difficult to illustrate on TV when you've got rows of iTech technicians banging away uh, on keyboards in front of a computer uh, screen. Strategies and concepts may sound good to the intellectual community, but are difficult to explain to the public. And many of the operations that we're going to see in the future are operations that nobody knows about until the government chooses to reveal them in many cases. Uh, uh, the, some experts refer to this as the War of the Shadows, the more covert type of clandestine operations. There is even a school of international relations at the moment that believes that we are going from coercion brought about essentially through armed forces and military means. I mean by coercion, the ability to shape the environment to produce a political outcome, to coercion essentially now going to sanctions or economic instruments or, or diplomatic uh, means in, in, instead. So fewer operations, less visibility. And how can one make a rationale for the armed forces in that kind of environment? Second big issue. We obviously are dealing with a more public scepticism, a greater public scepticism regarding the utility uh, of armed uh, uh, forces in the wake of Iraq uh, and, and Afghanistan. Did they sort of oversell what they were able to uh, achieve? I, I personally think that this would be totally unfair of our armed forces, and I'll explain why in, in, in just a, 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 a moment. You could argue that the military missions, as narrowly defined, have been perfectly achieved in virtually all of the interventions that either NATO as such or NATO countries have carried on. But, of course, the narrative has slipped uh, from one which was fairly clear at the beginning to one which has become much more fuzzy uh, in the long term regarding stabilization and, and uh, nation uh, uh, building. Thirdly, there is a, a lack of, of clear vision uh, when it comes to where we are going in the future. Uh, as Clemenceau said, are we going to prepare for the last war on the assumption that the future will be more of the same and that we train and equip to get Afghanistan right uh, the next time round? Will it be uh, very uh, different? Do we build uh, nuclear-capable submarines or, or conventional uh, cruisers? Uh, do we build maritime drones or maritime patrol uh, aircraft? Do we invest in aircraft carriers, the latest in the United States, the Gerald B. Ford is costing $12.9 billion at the moment, or, or do we invest uh, in uh, 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 flat-bottomed Corvette patrol boats for uh, coastal uh, security and, and piracy. Do the uh, three armed services, uh, as they seek to position themselves, air forces, land forces, maritime forces, have a, a joined up vision, which they can all subscribe to, of where their respective roles would be? I've just been in London last week at an absolutely fabulous conference called Markhamet, where I learned a lot, where the maritime dimension of NATO made an extremely convincing case for why the maritime dimension of security is going to be ever more important in the 21st century, uh, and we need, therefore, to invest more in maritime capabilities. But, but clearly, uh, if the public are to be convinced, the three services themselves have to produce a joint uh, uh, vision. Is the role of our armed forces to go back to high-end uh, operations uh, on the assumption that 
he can do the high end, can do every other end uh, as, 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 as well? Or is there now a sense that the role of the armed forces is essentially going to be an adjunct uh, to homeland or domestic defence? The new uh, uh, chairman of the uh, Joint Chiefs in the uh, UK the other day gave a very interesting speech where he positioned very much the British armed forces in terms of homeland defence. Uh, he referred to mad cow disease, where I remember this very well. We did, they, the armed forces did successfully intervene uh, uh, to uh, round up and incinerate many diseased cows. The Olympic Games, where the armed forces stepped in very uh, well uh, to rescue the failing Group 4. I better be careful saying failing, but at least uh, not able to fulfill their contract. Uh, he also mentioned flooding and, and, and so on. Um, is our role to prepare for our own uh, modernised forces, or more to spend our money uh, training and equipping the armed forces of others outside the NATO alliance to do the job. So what are the lessons of the last few years in terms of the, uh, the future vision of the way we want to go? The next issue is the shift in security. It's quite clear that the great beneficiaries of the last few uh, years have been the intelligence services, uh, have been the police, have been uh, uh, the uh, pre uh, great prominence of uh, closed-circuit TV cameras uh, on our streets and in our cities, uh, beefing up our, our border guards, uh, beefing up our emergency rescue services as the focus of security has shifted from the defense of territory more to the defense of populations and their uh, way uh, of life. Uh, and therefore, if you like, the monopoly that maybe the armed forces had a few years ago in terms of the security debate and the providers of security also has become so much more uh, uh, fuzzy. It's interesting today, again, if I can refer to my own country, the UK, that what tends to make the headlines is when the armed forces are talking about recruiting a cyber uh, reserve uh, force. And even some speculation that anybody, even with a criminal record, could be recruited into this force under the right type of conditions. And, of course, providing these people, obviously, uh, pledged to, uh, to mend their uh, way. So there's also, again, a sort of certain lack of certainty about whether the armed forces play their future role by being loyal to themselves or by transforming into a rather different type of force than we've been used to. And then finally, at least in the public domain, the lower salience of defence and security. When I came into this business in the 1980s, we had a, a multitude of MPs specialising in defence and security. It was actually seen as a good passport to ministerial promotion. The other day I ran into a friend of mine who's now been elected to the House of Commons and I said, oh, it's great that you're in the Parliament because you're going to be able to make the case for security and defence. He said, you must be joking. I'm not going to do that. Uh, I see that the path to promotion, much more in dealing with health and pensions and social security issues, and I'm relearning my dossier. We don't have the same network of Atlantic committees or NGOs. Very few newspapers these days claim to have a full-time defence correspondent. So, in a way, my first conclusion, which I think is a good point for defence matters, is clearly the armed forces are not going to sell themselves in the way that they did for generations when people had military service, served in wars, uh, saw their armed forces out there on duty, had an acute sense uh, of an imminent uh, uh, threat. Um, armed forces have a rationale, and I believe a very big one, and I'm going to try to make it for you in a minute. But clearly, we have to do our own public diplomacy now. Uh, if we succeed in this effort or not, will depend on us and our own uh, intelligence and our own uh, efforts. As we approach this debate, and this is where I want to sort of launch my petards into the room today, I think we have to be pretty clear about what sort of arguments are going to work and what sort of arguments are not going to work. If you have a Defence Matters campaign, it's obvious that you're going to have to first and foremost select the good arguments the ones that resonate, uh, and not waste time, of course, in effort or money with arguments that are not likely to. Now, you may disagree with me here, but at least to launch the debate. One argument I think is, is not going to work with the public is the argument that we should just be ready for the sake of being ready. 
Now, from a military perspective, yes, of course we've got to be ready. It's the most fundamental thing. The Connected Forces Initiative, exercising, preserving interoperability is, is critical, absolutely critical. But from a public perspective, can we alone base our narrative around that we are going to have to be uh, ready? Ready for what is obviously going to be uh, the key question. For what scenarios, for what tasks, against which uh, potential dangers and risks do we believe we are being ready? If we have an exercise, for example, I don't believe we should just say where it is and who's participating. What are we exercising for? Why uh, have we chosen this particular scenario? What do we want to uh, uh, get out of it? Secondly, I don't believe that it's enough to say that the past is going to be, uh, the future is going to be like the past. Uh, there is an acute sense that, of course, no war ever resembles or conflict the uh, 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 previous one. Uh, and therefore, I think we have to tie the defense narrative very acutely to a sense of what the future type of challenges uh, are going to be. And we should be frank and open and honest uh, with our public opinion uh, about this. What do we worry about? What is in our minds? I mean, we can educate our publics without any arrière-pensée when it comes to cyber threats or identity uh, uh, theft or, or uh, compromise uh, on the internet. We can be extremely frank with our publics, as the director of MI5 in the UK is, more and more frequently, about threats from terrorist uh, organisations uh, as well. Our public takes this on board. It's even part of producing social resilience. So we also have to be equally, I think, open in engaging them with what we see, not as threats from countries. This is not a question of frightening people, but what we see is the kind of things that keep us awake at night, where we believe that military forces are still fundamental for protecting our interests and helping us to shape the environment uh, positively. I don't also believe, although you may disagree with me, that uh, we should base our narrative on resisting cuts. I regret cuts as much as anybody, but let's be honest, they're going to uh, happen. Uh, and if we devote our energies to trying to save, for example, the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers, again, a, a very recent example from my country, uh, which didn't happen, uh, the, the, that was the regiment was not saved, uh, we're going to de take our energies away from a more necessary task of, of shaping the future of the armed forces. Cuts are reality. How do we work around them? How do we make the best of them? How do we focus on the uh, uh, priorities? Instead of trying to stop the clock, we have to go with the flow. For example, what is going to be the balance between what we spend on readiness, in other words, keeping our existing posture uh, at high availability, to what we spend in being prepared, particularly in the defense industrial area, critical technologies, to be ready uh, to wage the operations of the future? Finally, what I don't think is going to work is the sense that we should be, have, that define the military forces as being something that deals with every kind of threat cyber threat, terrorist threats, uh, immigration threats. I, I don't believe it. I, I think that armed forces are better at doing certain things than others. They're not a kind of tous azimut option. And the more we try to justify armed forces by bringing in every conceivable threat, to my mind, the more we weaken the rationale. For example, where the public sector uh, clearly sees that, for example, private industry is more in the front line of dealing with the cyber threats or the intelligence services or the police or the border guards are more in the front line with dealing with uh, other things. So we should be very clear around which peg are we tying the rationale of the armed forces. So that said, what will work uh, in my opinion? Number one, and this is one of the interesting findings of uh, the exercise that Jan has been steering with the other think tanks uh, sponsored by public diplomacy. The armed forces are clearly linked to a sense of national identity. Most people don't want their country to sort of drop out of international uh, affairs. Uh, they have a sense of the armed forces are ultimately the guarantee of the national voice in the world, national prestige, national influence, the ability to affect global outcomes in a favourable way. You may dismiss this as sort of trite patriotism, but there's a clear example, uh, again from the studies that you've carried out, that this works, and therefore we should not be ashamed to say that you know, decreasing our armed forces inevitably leads to a decrease in the kind of influence we're going to have. This argument resonates and we should use it. Secondly, we should be quite clear uh, in this connection that our armed forces mean that the functionality of society can be protected. 
uh, that as long as we have our armed forces, we can cope with major situations. The armed forces are there to cope with major situations. They can cope with minor ones, but their rationale and their exclusivity is to cope with major uh, ones. In other words, they keep us free from uh, intimidation, uh, so we can't be blackmailed. They stop other people miscalculating about our intentions. Uh, we can shape the environment. Look at Syria recently, the threat of the use of force in a way that allows diplomacy to exceed where it couldn't before. As Frederick the Great said, diplomacy without arms is like music without uh, 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 I instruments as well. Where we need to put power on the ground quickly, only the armed forces can achieve that. Um, nobody likes US bases in Asia, right? Until there is Hurricane Haiyan until there is Fukushima and the tsunami as well as the earthquake, until there is the uh, tsunami uh, in Indonesia. Who is the first with the mostest? Uh, it is the armed forces, and then everybody loves uh, the US base in Asia. Uh, where you need to suddenly have an effect, that is where the armed forces come in. Things get rough, as they inevitably do, and the armed forces come in. So my strong plea today is link the narrative to the big stuff rather than the soft security or the small stuff. Not that the armed forces don't have their role to play there, but that is not where their rationale is uh, to be in the future. Next thing, uh, we have to have more efficiency, however, uh, uh, as we go forward. Uh, we will be permanently undermined in making this argument if we continue to not sort out the defence procurement field, which continues, as you know, uh, to be something which has dragged on for many years and is so difficult to do. Our publics want efficiency. Uh, def the, if you look, for example, in many of our parliaments, even those who are in favour of defence are also in favour of budget reductions. They are budget hawks before they are defence hawks. Uh, we see this, for example, quite interestingly in the US Congress at the moment. I know that this is not exclusively a role of the armed forces to sort out the procurement issue, uh, but smart defence, multi multinational cooperation, anything that points to efficiency is going to be an argument. But the defence industrial base is also important. I noticed that even in the recent agreement in Germany on the new coalition, Foreign policy was also justified in terms of preserving the security of supply of German industry, of rare earths and, and raw materials. The functionality of the system the, and therefore the ability to preserve through military spending also a independent autonomous defence industrial uh, base and security of supply resonates as well. Do not forget that there are 750,000 people in the European Union alone who owe their livelihoods to the uh, defence uh, uh, industry. So what are my recommendations? First of all, let's take national security strategies and see how NATO helps our nations to fulfill those national security strategies. Instead of taking what does the nation do for NATO, which is so often the focal point of our discussion, let us take what NATO does for the nation uh, and link it the other way. Link exercises to contingency plans. We have having an exercise in order to be able to fulfill a defence mission. Let's say what that uh, uh, is. Let's also be clear about what we're worried about and what, therefore, we need to preserve capability. For example, at the Maritime Conference last week, it was anti-ship missiles, anti-access missiles, invisible sea mines, uh, 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 for, for example, uh, to which ships are, are very vulnerable. It could be cyber capabilities or it could be missile proliferation. Uh, we don't want to frighten people, but we have to be pretty clear about what kind of capabilities worry us and what the effect uh, uh, would be uh, on us. Uh, I think that this is an important part uh, of the mission uh, as, 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 as well. Finally, we need to shape the legacy of the last uh, 20 years. It would be totally wrong for public opinion to get the impression after 2014, uh, summarised by Robert Graves' famous book, Goodbye to All That. We're turning a page on a failure that should never have been attempted in the, in, in the first place. The fact of the matter is, is that the armed forces have achieved spectacular results over the last 20 years. We stopped a civil war breaking out in the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. And NATO implemented one of the first and only examples of preventive diplomacy in history, but also using the presence of armed forces. Uh, we stopped ethnic cleansing. 
uh, in Bosnia, albeit late in the day. We saved uh, a whole uh, population uh, from a potential massacre uh, in Bosnia at the time. Again, late in the day, but if we hadn't intervened. Uh, in Kosovo, uh, we allowed a population, whether you agree this or not, ultimately to exercise self-determination in particular historical circumstances and stopped a campaign of ethnic cleansing. Not that we went into Kosovo to do that, that became the consequence. But we stopped terrible human rights abuses. Uh, in Afghanistan, we took down one of the most egregious regimes in modern times, Taliban linked to Al-Qaeda. Imagine, imagine if the Taliban and Al-Qaeda uh, were still uh, in collusion together in Afghanistan today. How many more 9-11s uh, would we uh, have had? Um, we've, all, we've practically eliminated piracy from the Gulf of Aden, or at least dramatically uh, reduced it. The trouble is our, our publics have a very short historical memory. They forgot what it used to be like before we uh, uh, intervened. And of course, we never ever tell them about the consequences of not acting, only the consequences of doing something. So it would be a great failure on our part if we failed to shape the narrative after Afghanistan, drawing on everything we've done over the last uh, 20 years in a way that suggests that somehow this was a waste of time. But the most fundamental thing is that the armed forces are not social workers. They're not a development agency. Their job is not long-term reconstruction or stabilisation. The armed forces are there to put power onto a problem immediately with an effect uh, to stop threats, uh, to recreate a new political situation. Uh, they are short-term, in my opinion, uh, and we should be clear where their responsibility does not lie and where the responsibility of diplomats and, and others, social workers, development workers, uh, uh, take uh, over. So what I'm arguing, in conclusion, is that we are going to have to make the arguments ourselves. We have to link the armed forces to what they're good at uh, and not pretend that the only way to justify them is to pretend that they're no longer armed forces. Uh, the more we put them into a context of everybody else, the more we relativise them. We have to be very clear about where we see armed forces and where NATO needs to maintain presence. For example, do we need post-Afghanistan to be in the Western Indian Ocean, where so many things are going to be happening? Do we need, after Operation Ocean Shield, to remain in the Gulf? Do we need to be in the Eastern Mediterranean after Operation Active Endeavour simply to maintain stability? Where are our key interests in terms of the functionality of our uh, societies uh, 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 lie? So I believe that this is a wonderful uh, challenge. Uh, I think this is an argument we can win. Uh, I think this is an argument that we can only win if we all speak with a single voice and rather than defend our particular uh, niches. But I think it's also vital that we set out with the right arguments, the convincing arguments, the arguments which hold up to uh, uh, scrutiny. But it's important uh, because we've seen in the past, uh, in the 1930s, in other periods of history, tragic examples of where threats emerged and dangers emerged against the background of an inward-looking, complacent uh, uh, public opinion. Um, and then we had to address those problems beyond the time which, when we could still have prevented wars. Uh, the only way to ultimately deal with the problem was through global war with terrible, terrible consequences. Uh, and uh, therefore, there's always going to be, ladies and gentlemen, in all our societies, a disconnect inevitably between how the professionals see their role and maybe how uh, our public sees their role. It's maybe not such a bad thing that our public doesn't worry about these things. It's a sign of our success. But we should not allow that disconnect to become too large. Things will get rough, uh, and we'll need the armed forces to deal with that roughness when it eventually comes back. Thank you very much.